your mommy's fault or your daddy's fault or your grandfather's fault. It is you making this life whatever you choose to make it. Stand up and take responsibility for your own actions and choices. Amen? You would never find Paul preaching the psychology that is being preached today. The fact that Jesus was made of the seed of David means that he is heir to the throne of David. Of David's throne, the Lord said in 2 Samuel 7, 16, Thine house and thy kingdom shall be established, how long? Forever. forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. <laughs> David's kingdom is therefore coextensive with the inheritance promised to Abraham, which is the whole world. Turn to Romans 4, chapter, or, chapter 4, verse 13. Let's read that. Romans 4, 13. Diane, can you read that for me? <laughs> For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Mm. Where does that righteousness come from? Jesus Christ. Christ. The angel said of Jesus in Luke chapter 1, verses 32 and 33, The Lord God shall give him the throne of his father David. He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there shall be no end. But all this involved his bearing the curse of the inheritance and suffering death. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. Hebrews 12, 2. In Philippians 2, 9 we read, Wherefore God has also highly exalted him and given him a what? A name that is above all names. You need to understand and grasp the exalted position of Jesus Christ. And then you need to realize what Christ wants to do in you. And that exalted person wants to be your personal friend. Did you hear what she said? That exalted person wants to be your personal friend. He wants to be your personal savior. He wants to live inside your heart. Listen. We look at celebrity. We look at power, politicians, rulers. And yet, we don't grasp the excellency of Jesus Christ. And the exaltedness of his position, of his character, and the exaltedness of what he will do for us and in us. Jesus Christ did not come to keep you down here. Okay? Jesus Christ came to restore in you what was lost in the fall of Adam and Eve and raise you up and continue to raise you up and bring you up to, as the Spirit of Prophecy says, <laughs> a level that we can't even imagine. But if you allow Christ to do it, he will do it in you. It should. It should not make you a legalist, but it should make you an oddity to everybody else. Because that's what the Bible says. We are a peculiar people. The problem is, we are a peculiar people, but not that peculiar the way he said. Sometimes we're just weird. <laughs> As with Christ, so with us. It is through much tribulation, understand this, as with Christ, so with us, it is through much tribulation that we enter the kingdom of God. He who fears reproach, or who makes his lowly birth or his inherited traits an excuse for his shortcomings, will fail of the kingdom of heaven. You need to understand that. Jesus Christ went to the lowest depths of humiliation in order that all who are in those depths might, if they would, ascend with him to the utmost heights of exaltation. That's what Christ has done for you. How many times have you heard somebody say, well, fill in the blank for the nationality. I'm Irish. I have a temper. Uh, I have red hair. I have a temper. Uh, I'm Italian. I have a temper. I'm Hungarian. I have a temper. I'm whatever you want to say, I have a temper, and that's just the way I'm made, and you know, you're going to have to live with it, because that's not that we're going to say that. No. <laughs> that's good. You're just going to have to live with it, because that's just who I am, and 
And what that sentence that you just read was saying, let no man say that because of those things that, that he can't have a victory. That's right. And one of the <laughs> things about victory, and I have an amazing book that I want to share um, at some point, but if, if we had the mindset of the worldview, you know, one of the great things that the Adventist Church has is the concept of the great controversy. Mm -hmm. That is ever before us. That we know that we have chosen to be on God's side in His army. That's why here we're His bond servants. And that there is a war going on. Amen. And Jesus, you know, He did not have a propensity to sin. Mm -hmm. Not because He didn't have a human nature. But because He was so fully aware of this war going on. And He had so fully aligned Himself with His Heavenly Father's side of this war. That when he looked at people who could tempt him to sin, he did not see it as an occasion for his flesh. He saw it with his father's perspective and said, this is a fallen human being for whom one day I will be the Lamb of God. Mm -hmm. And his change, when he, when he looked at stuff, gave him the victory, even though he had to fight it in his descendants, you know, in this terrible uh, genetic heritage that he had. Amen. But and as he overcame, we can overcome too. That was very well said. Very well said. <laughs> Actually, that was really beautiful. Yes. Um, so, with that in mind, with what we just read, with what I just talked about, let me ask you this question. When it comes, uh, Linda, you have your hand up? Well, I just wanted to say too, the environment does have an effect yes. on a person, but Yes. You can't blame your environment for all your poor choices. You have the choice to either live in that environment or you can get out with your own choices. Actually, this is the key to, to that. You can blame your environment if you don't have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. Okay? If you don't have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, if you're not Christ, then yes, your environment is going to dictate who and what you're going to be. But if you have the Spirit of the living God inside of you, does it matter where you're at? Does it matter what your environment is? Who gives you strength and power? The Holy Spirit. Is there something that He cannot overcome? Alright? And that's the key. This is why we go back to what I said in the beginning. This is all about a living relationship with Christ. If you don't have that, if the Spirit of Christ is not living in you, this will make no sense and you will gain no victory ever. Amen. But if the Spirit of Christ lives inside of you, there should be nothing that can overcome you. Because Jesus overcame the world. And then he told you, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Right? Listen, going back to this question about Adventism, historical Adventism, what it means for Jesus to have taken on human nature and what kind of nature did he take on, this passage that we read in Romans 1, verse 3, that he took on the seed of David. Who was Jesus' mother? What kind of nature did she have? Was she born immaculately? No. Or did she have a fallen human nature like you and I? Okay, now I want you to think about this. When it comes to the nature of Christ, it's not that difficult. <laughs> Unless you make it difficult. Let me ask you a question. In the incarnation... A baby is made, a baby is made. You know how babies are made, right? Okay. Did God do something different in the forming of Jesus Christ? In making him? Yes. What did he do different then? Outside of the Holy Spirit, what was different in that inception? No, conception. That well, that's a long story. <laughs> <laughs> Think about this, it's not. Some people Mary was told that the Holy Spirit will overcome you and you will conceive and have a baby. Did God do some type of magic in her womb to make Jesus different from any other human being? No. Did Jesus have DNA? If they, if they had a DNA test back then, were they able to get DNA from his mama's side from him? Yeah. Okay, so think about this. Think about this. They would have got something and they would say, wow, what is this? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Jesus was conceived and he was in his mother's womb for nine months and he came out like every other baby. Is that right? Correct. So he had a part of his father and a part of his mother. 
Is that right? Amen. Jesus is known as the God-man. Is that right? Was he fully God? Yes. In the incarnation, how'd that come to be? Because of who his father was. Is that right? Was he fully man? Yes. Who did he get his humanity from? Man. His mother. What kind of nature did his mother give him? Sin. That's not hard to grasp. This is the question of, do you believe in Catholicism's view of Mary? Or do you believe in the historical Adventist view of the nature of Christ and what the Bible teaches? That he took on a nature like you and I. A fallen nature, yet without sin. How is he able to overcome? It's like Deborah so eloquently put it. Jesus lived a life of being born again from birth to death. You understand? This is why to be saved, you must be what? Born again. Jesus was born again throughout his entire life. He had his focus totally on God. He was submitted to God. Isn't that what we're called for? Do you understand that when it says, as Jesus' words were in Revelation, overcome even as I have overcome? You overcome only if the Holy Spirit is living inside of you and you have submitted fully and completely to you. And you're able to see the world, as Deborah said, through the eyes of God instead of through fallen selfish eyes. Alright, so, verse 4. Jesus was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of what? Holiness. Why is that put in there? Why is that part of that verse that he was... Let me read it again. He was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness. Why does he use that specific phrase, the Spirit of holiness? Is that important for us? Did Jesus really, was Jesus really tempted? Did he really, actually, could he really have fallen into sin? Yes. How did that not happen? It did not happen because he submitted himself every day fully and completely to his Father. And the Holy Spirit dwelt inside of him. Jesus said, of myself, I can do nothing. He went into a town and because of their lack of faith, he couldn't do many miracles there. Did you ever find that strange? Yeah. Yeah. But do you not find that strange? He couldn't do many miracles there. He could do all things. What was it that stopped him from doing miracles? Their unbelief. Their unbelief, Martin? Well, in all the miracles that he did, he always said at the end, it's your faith that healed you. This concept of what we're talking about right now, that Jesus couldn't do many miracles because of their lack of faith, this is another foundational aspect of Adventism, victory in Jesus, and being this generation that will reflect his character 100% before he comes back. Because if you don't believe the power that the Holy Spirit wants to give you, give you victory in your life, will not take place. Amen? Amen. Amen. That goes right back to what the gift that he's given us, which is the gift of free choice, hmm. which is all that Adam and Eve ever had to offer in the garden, was Amen. their will. Amen. And so, you know, if they were in this village and nobody wanted to believe, it was their will that they were withholding from their thoughts to give that, to give that uh, credence, that that acceptance of Jesus, that love to Jesus, and when, when they withheld that with thoughts of, who is this guy? Isn't he just a carpenter's son? Mm -hmm. They were withholding thoughts of love. They were withholding thoughts of acceptance. They were changing their will to yield to love, to yield to acceptance of what Jesus' mission was. And that's where their faith would follow, with that love, with that yielding of their will. Then their faith followed in believing in him, and, and that's our thing too, you know, 
when I hold on to my sin, I believe that what I'm doing is going to be better for me than what he's saying I should do. And I'm rejecting him. I'm not believing and I'm not receiving the gift of righteousness that he wants to give me on that particular thing, whatever it is. So would you agree that what that is about is that you've rejected the relationship with him? Yeah. But you've taken yourself, you have taken yourself out of his hands. He did not move away from you, but you willingly chose to move away from him. You have turned your back on him. And he allowed you to do that. Because it's your choice. Jesus said, I always do all things for the Father. always do all things Listen, that's what God wants to do inside of you so that you come to that point in your life where you will do that. So, again, verse 4, declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, through whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for His name. What was the proof that Jesus was the Son of God? Amen. It was His conquering death. That was the thing that the apostles preached that this man came back from the grave. He has power over death. He is the Son of God. And it was through that power, the power of the resurrected Christ, that impelled them, compelled them? Compelled them to keep moving forward and preaching this wherever they went. Now listen, where they preached this, that everybody said, wow, that's a great message. Thank you. Come eat with us. They were willing to suffer really bad things so that people could have the choice and the opportunity to hear Christ and accept the love of God and have a relationship with Him. You read as you get to chapter 16 in Romans that Paul's desire was to come to them, come to them, come to them, but he was hindered. He also, you find out that he didn't want to go and plant the gospel where somebody else had worked already. He wanted to go where they never heard it before. Think about this. They're going to stone you. They don't want to hear what you've got to say. Go somewhere where they've heard it already and they've accepted it. At least they'll be more friendly to you. That wasn't Paul's thought. His thought was that he had that born again nature inside of him. He cared more about sinners who didn't know Jesus Christ than he cared about himself. That's what God wants to do inside of me. Verse 6, Among whom you also are called, I uh, know, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called saints. This is your calling. God has made you saint. Do you understand that? This is one of our problems as well, is we don't understand who we are in Christ. We say, if I don't mess up, then God will love me, and God will accept me, then I can be a saint. What you need to realize is you are a saint, and God will make the ideal become a reality. You guys understand? Wow, that was only, only one amen to that. Amen. Seriously, that's the gospel. The gospel is what you can never do for yourself. God has already done for you. And if you believe it, God will do it in you. That's the gospel. That's what you should say amen to. Amen. Um, what time do we stop here? Um, Look on Sunday's lesson. Sunday's lesson. It says at the end, under the heading, the Apostle Paul's letter. It says, Paul established a church at Corinth on his second missionary journey between A.D. 49 and 52. On his third journey, A.D. 53 through 58, he visited Greece again and received an offering for the saints in Jerusalem near the end of his journey. Therefore, the epistle to the Romans probably was written in the early months of A.D. 58. 
as Paul was making his rounds, he already understood what was happening in these churches, that wherever he went, once he left, wolves would come in and create havoc in the churches. This is what happened as we studied the book of Galatians. This is why he went to and wrote to the Galatian churches to try to straighten out the heresies that were being taught there. And he probably understood that these same people would make their way finally up to Rome. Now, did Paul establish the church in Rome? No. Did one of the apostles? It may have been started by lay people. Think about that. By lay people. And yet, started by lay people, but this church was known around the world for their faithfulness. Okay? Let that sink in. Let that sink in. It was because of their their burning passion for Jesus Christ that allowed them to be such a strong church. Paul, his desire was to visit them, to impart some type of spiritual teaching to them. you got to love it when he actually says this, and you'll study this further on. He says, so I can impart some well, know that maybe we can learn together. You know what I'm saying? you got to love how Paul wrote it in his care for the sheep, for his flocks. There's a um, phenomenon that I've observed mm -hmm. when a church might have a time when there's no pastor. Yes. People who uh, previously have been looking to leadership to accomplish everything, all of a sudden go, oh, there's nobody here. What are we going to do? And they rise up individually and more people do more things mm -hmm. because they are not... Um, looking towards the leadership to accomplish what God may be wanting them to do. Do you know that when the Adventist church was founded, that's the way it was supposed to be in all churches? They were never supposed to have a pastor that stayed at any one church. The pastors were supposed to be just like Paul. Establish church, and then move on. Establish another one, and move on. But, just like the Israelites, the people cried out for a king, they cried out for a pastor. And once they got a full-time pastor, Spirit in the life of that church started to go down. So, continuing on with this lesson on Sunday, it says, In his epistle, this is a quote from Acts of the Apostles, page 373. In his epistle to the Romans, Paul sets forth the great principles of the gospel. He stated his position on the questions which were agitating the Jewish and the Gentile churches and showed that the hopes and promises which he had once belonged, or which had once belonged, especially to the Jews, were now offered to the Gentiles also. As we said, it is important, it is important in the study of any book of the Bible to know why it was written, that is, what situation it was addressing. Hence, it is important for our understanding of the epistle to the Romans to know which questions were agitating the Jewish and the Gentile churches. Next week's lesson we will address these questions. But in the bottom of this, it asks you, what kind of issues are agitating your church at present? This is not a rhetorical question. Okay, what kind of issues are agitating your church at present? One is you're going to be getting a new pastor. Okay, and the wonder about what's going to happen with that. How do you deal with that? Okay, you've been used to the same person for the last ten and a half years, now there's going to be a change. And some people don't like change. But let me ask you a question. Is your faith in a man or in God? Do you believe that God is in control? Do you believe that God is with you? Do you believe that God has led you in the past? If He's led you in the past, will He not continue to lead you in the future? What's our biggest fear? And what's our biggest concern? What's the biggest thing we have to worry about? The biggest thing we have to worry about is if we forget how God has led us in the past. Why is that such a fear? Because if you forget how God has led you in the past and troubles come up in the future, where are you going to turn? Jesus couldn't do a lot of miracles because of their unbelief. If you forget how God has led you in the past, then you'll have that same spirit of unbelief. Realize who you are in Christ. Realize that God has not left you orphans. That God is in control of your 
Not me, not this man that's coming, but God himself. Allow God to work out his will. What are you called to do? Again, not a rhetorical question. No. Let me ask you a question when it comes to the conference. Is the conference fall? Yes. What was the adjective? What is the Come on, I'm not English. No, I'm not Did you say fallen? Yes. Is the conference fallen? Are they in a state of apostasy? Yes. Yes. Have mercy, Lord. That's a direct question, right? And this is why you're afraid of this man coming. Because it's the conference who's sending him. And only two people, but a bunch more were thinking the same thing. But let me ask you a question. Is there anywhere in the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy that says that the hierarchy of this church, let me put it another way, that the established church and its conferences are going to be replaced by something else? No. It's going to look like it's going to fall. But God is going to take it all the way through to Amen. the end. Amen. Are we not told in Scripture to submit to those who are in authority above us? Yes. It's the conference. Do they have any authority here in this church? Yes. Then what does the Bible say you should do? Submit. And that's what God is calling you to do. Give this man a chance. Prove Now, does submitting mean that you just go with everything that's said? No. If you hear open heresy, what do you do? You stand up and you stand against it. But he's not here yet, you don't know. So don't make up your mind already. Alright? Give him a chance. These are the issues agitating the church. This is my last day here. When he comes, I'm not going to be here. This is the last time I'm going to see you guys for a long time. I need to know for my own peace that you guys are going to be okay. If you keep your focus on Christ, you'll be okay. But if you allow things inside your own heart to come up and think that's the Spirit of God, you will fall. Do you understand that? Make sure your focus is on Scripture. Make sure you understand historical Adventism. Make sure you know who you are as a church and where you want to go. God will not forsake you. God will not leave you. But show the love of Christ. Amen? Amen? What other things agitate your church? This is my last day here. I know a lot of things here because I'm the pastor. Amen. <laughs> worry about the rest of us. That's very good because that's exactly what's in my head. Look, look around. Look around. She said, she said, worrying about all of us meshing together. Okay? Look around. We are a diverse church. This is why I've stayed in the Adventist church so long. Because I have been to my brother's church and there have been 800 people there that are all the same color. That's not what heaven's about. Only one? Two? That should be an amen from everybody. What has God called you for? To segregate? Or has God called you to show the world that Christ has torn down every barrier that separates us. That God has taken from one blood all of humanity and saved it in Himself. Amen. And that in Jesus Christ, she's no different from me and I'm no different from her. I love her like she's my mother. You mean the world to me. But I know that's an issue here. My brother back there knows it's an issue here. And if you guys don't come to an understanding of who you are in Jesus Christ and what He's done for you. This issue has been smoothed over and it raises itself up and then it just gets pushed right back down and gets smoothed over. And you will not address it. You won't address the evils that are in your heart for your brother and your sister that may be of a different color. Of a different political persuasion. Who may see and interpret the Bible differently from you, Marty? Now you're stepping on the toes. It's my last day here. You can find me. <laughs> <laughs> these are the issues of this church. I know these issues. I've dealt with them for a long time. They're not going to go away when I leave. You, as a congregation, 
need to know what Christ has called you for. Do you want victory over sin? Amen. What sin? I say, I say in myself, Lord, give me victory over evil thoughts. But don't touch my heart because I have an evil eye against my brother. Because I just don't like the culture. I don't like them coming into my country. What I want God to do is give me victory over sin. All of it. I cannot have Christ in my heart if I have hatred towards my brother. Is that right, Leslie? Amen. We cannot.